Good evening, everyone. I'll stand to start at least. My name is Ryan Turner. I'm artistic director of Emmanuel Music and co-director, along with my colleague Pamela Delal of the Bach Institute. We're thrilled to welcome all our Bach Institute fellows. Fellows, can you raise your hands that are here? This is for you. <laughs> and I'm really delighted to have Simona Dinnerstein with us today. Um, you can read about Simona, there's a, and you can go on her website and learn a lot more about her. Um, just a personal story that Simona's never heard me tell. Um, I learned about Simona's playing from her recording of the Goldberg Variations, and have admittedly never been a fan of Bach on the piano, was somewhat of a purist in that way, and Simona transformed my thinking. And I fell in love with that recording, and about the same time, my wife and I moved, and our neighbors, three doors up the street, were friends with Simona, and studied piano with Simona. And then I started to get, I think I have every one of her CDs because my neighbor kept giving them to me as gifts. Um, and so I fell in love with Simona's playing, and I always had this dream of finding a way to collaborate with Simona. Come full circle, last year when we did Bernard Labadie's arrangement of the Goldberg Variations, I invited Simona to give a little demonstration and talk on Zoom, which was absolutely superb. And uh, we invited her back. And th that was part of the Bach Institute, incidentally. We invited her back this year. And on June 4th, we are finally having a collaboration with the Emanuel Music Orchestra, where Simona is playing two Bach concerti, an arrangement at by Philip Lasser as well. So that's enough talking. Simona, welcome. <laughs> So what we want to talk about today is the idea of secular versus sacred and how much do words influence musical meaning and how much does musical meaning influence the words. And in June, Simona is going to be playing the E major keyboard concerto, BWV 1053 with us. Incidentally, that work is based on three movements that we find in the cantata repertoire. Um, its origins, we believe, are actually a lost oboe or violin concerto from when Bach was in Curtin, which was 1717 to 1723. Those of you that were at the talk on Wednesday night with Christoph, um, Christoph explained that he had very little liturgical music duties and so in that period of Bach's life, we see um, a lot of work with organ music, the violin partitas and the sonatas, as well as the cello suites. Um, so we believe there was a lost concerto. We're not sure what, for what instrument. Flash forward to 1726. It's Bach's fourth year in Leipzig. And he is growing increasingly disheartened with the level of play and singing at the St. Thomas Kirche. He starts to, instead of having introductory choruses to cantatas, he starts having instrumental symphonias. Um, and it was something also that he could have his younger son, um, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach play, who was quite accomplished by that point. It, I think, um, was a practical thing in that we knew the level of singing wasn't, the level of students coming in was not at the level that he had wanted. So he was able to um, dispense with opening choruses on some occasions, not always. Um, so in October of 1726, the cantata um, 169, which is an alto solo cantata, opens with this dazzling D major symphonia. Later on in the cantata, there is an aria, which, is, which will become the middle movement of the E major keyboard concerto. Two weeks later, cantata 49, which is a dialogue cantata for soprano and bass, opens with another dazzling symphonia in D major, which um, Eight years later, is, sorry, 12 years later, is transposed into E major and is the final movement of the E major mm -hmm. harpsichord concerto. 
when Bach basically is finished with his cantata composing at the St. Thomas Kirche, only for rare occasions or to fill out a cycle, but he's, all of his cantata composition has been focused on the first three to four years of his time at the St. Thomas Kirche. He turns his attentions to the Collegium Musica. And in the mid to late 1730s, we see this outpouring of keyboard concertos. The longest, most complicated, most difficult, most forward-looking concerto is the concerto in E major, BWV 1053, for harpsichord or keyboard and orchestra. And it has these three movements, two from cantata 169 and one from cantata 49. So the question we have, we pose today is, and Simona and I talked about this, is how much does her playing of this music, is it influenced by the text of the music or its previous origins? So I turned to my colleague Pam DeLal, mezzo-soprano, who um, has performed this solo alto cantata, cantata 169, in the middle of the fifth movement is this aria that essentially is superimposed on top of the middle movement of the concerto. Now, Pam has to leave us very soon to go to another engagement. So we only have her for a short time. So I've asked Pam to sing a bit of the aria with Simona playing in its original key. And then Simona is gonna play a little bit of the middle movement as it is in the concerto key, and then we're going to talk about what we heard, what the differences are, and how their performance is influenced or not by the text. And I'm going to get out of the way.
Pamela, can you tell us about what you were singing? Yeah, so um, I'll just read the text in English. Um, and the way it was handed to Bach and the libretto is, die in me, world, and all your loves, so that my breast forever and ever on earth becomes practiced in the love of God. That's as far as the text, but it goes on, die in me, arrogance, riches, greed, you rejected urges of the flesh. I, I wanted to, so we were talking before about text and something that Pam said that I thought was really incredibly interesting was that sometimes the text and the music are saying opposite things. And you were talking about how you felt that this was particularly so in this movement. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so I read the text in a very particular affect because I think that if you had no context of the music and you read these words, you'd imagine something very sort of aggressive and rejecting and kind of assertive, right? I know I don't want the world and go away and, you know. And that's not what I hear or feel in the music at all. Um, to me, the music has this um, urging and longing and, and sort of a, um, it, it, it's half seductive, it's half dangerous, it feels overwhelming. All those sort of sudden harmonic shifts feel like, you know, the world is precarious. Um, so, so my feeling is that the aria in its context in the cantata is saying, I'm in this state where I'm assailed by all of these desires that I think are pulling me away from God. I want to get rid of them, but I don't know how. <laughs> and that to me is an extremely different take on these particular words than what you might imagine the music might be. I mean, I guess I have a slightly different feeling about that, which is that in order to convey wanting to have this sort of connection to God and to um, letting go of, of worldly things, you have to show the worldly things because there's no other way to convey that. There's no other way to convey that you don't want to have those feelings without showing the feelings. In the music. In the music. And um, I, I was, my father's an artist, so I was brought up um, seeing a lot of Renaissance art, which is almost all about Jesus. And, um, so what I was thinking about as you were talking was thinking about like these pietas that you could see, you know, um, where there's incredible suffering. You're seeing, uh, you know, Mary holding her son who died, but his body is so beautifully formed and so kind of, you have such a sense of, of the man that that's what gives it the pain when you're looking at it, is that it has that kind of feeling of, 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 of humanity, of being a human and then letting that go as the sacrifice. And I think that in his music, I feel like all the most beautiful parts of Bach's music have to do with with pain. And it's always the painful moments that are the most beautiful. And, um, and that is, I guess that's what makes it so connected for me to being, to, to, to grappling with being a human being because there's so much pain in being a human being. Before we talked about the words, what, what were the things you felt in this movement? What emotions? So, I mean, I, I think that it's, um, 
Well, first of all, what's interesting is that the keyboard part is like an aria, but it's actually not what the singer was singing. So it, it's a little bit of a confluence of the, of the aria and the organ part in the cantata, which is interesting to me because I think that it's a very, very melodic and sort of um, melismatic kind of part that, that's for the, for, the, for the keyboard to play. Um, there are lots of really strange intervals, intervallic leaps, um, these sort of big gestures and also syncopated gestures. And so I guess the chromaticism and the intervals um, feel and it's hard to find the right words because the whole point of being an instrumentalist is you don't need them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I would say that there's a very kind of sense of like, ur there's a sense of urgency in it to me that's very, um, it's urgent and there's something a bit pungent about it. Um, but the fact that the the, the rest of the orchestra is playing pretty much just pizzicatos the whole time, or just, just it's very sparse, extremely sparse. Um, the sparseness gives it a kind of ascetic quality too. So it's kind of very expressive and very contained at the same time, and I really like that combination. But I mean, I, I, it doesn't surprise me what the words say when you, when you read them out loud. Yeah. Um, I think that one thing we can't show you, well, you have a recording. We might be able to show you the texture, the, the organ, which was the huge featured soloist in that opening symphonia, is also playing a solo line with the singer in the middle movement, but also with strings who don't play pizzicato. So the, the impression of the movement in the cantata is very dense, in fact. Um, I was talking to Ryan earlier, I said it feels like, like the ocean is washing over you. There, there's kind of these big waves that come at you. Um, in fact, it's a bit of a challenge for the singer to sort of cut through that texture. So it's fascinating how Bach kind of completely transformed mm. that textural element when when he took the music. We tried it with me singing over what she played, and it's fascinating how it doesn't fit, right? Because you can hear it's the same concepts, but he shifts the chord changes around, and he, he does different things, and you, you can't actually just literally lay the voice part you know, in a different key on top of the keyboard part. So that, that shows you how completely he reimagined it. But to me, the the whole experience of the aria is this pull between I want to love God, but I keep getting pulled back into these other desires and I'm feeling not grounded, right? That, that's... But I, I think it's very interesting that he decided instead of taking the soprano part, the singer's the alto rather part, to take the organist's part. Like, I, I find it interesting that he cut that, he cut out the, the actual aria, yeah. you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that makes me think that the emotion that you're getting is coming from the instrumentalists. That that was, in a way, the most important music, was the music that was written for the rest of the, the orchestra and the organ. And that's kind of informing what you're what you're singing? I wouldn't disagree with that. You know, I mean, giving working myself right out of a job here. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think that um, that is so often the case, and we, we've been d discovering this in some of our aria rehearsals this week that um, the instrumental writing is so clear and detailed and motivically strong that it feels sometimes that the singer is merely commentary. 
I mean, they're also doing beautiful things, but that it's, it's in terms of the priority of kind of who's carrying the message, yeah. I think with Bach it often is the instruments. It's the untexted voice that does. And I, I was pointing out this one passage later in this aria where there's this incredibly beautiful melisma that the singer sings that um, it's like a roller coaster. It goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and it, it's constantly with shifting harmonies. And it's unbelievably vocal, but it's also the most instrumental passage in the piece because mm -hmm. it's completely de detached from text. And it's on the word desires or urges. Um, that, that to me is sort of a distillation of, of how it works. And it's like, you know, as people often say, the singer becomes another instrument. I think on that note, you're going to go? I'm going to slip All out. right. Thank you, Pam Duval. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Simona, when you prepare a work like this, did, did you look at the original, which, or we don't really know the original because the original is lost, but were you familiar with the cantata? Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, uh, it's. Uh, I th I've always find it very interesting to. Um, yeah, to listen to any kind of other sources. I mean, so much of Bach's music is, is recycled. You know, the other concerto that we're going to play, on the program in June is the G minor keyboard concerto, which started off as the A minor. Um, violin concerto, and this always deeply upsets all of the violinists in the orchestra. <laughs> They're like, "This isn't the wrong key. <laughs> we don't want to play it in G minor." Um, and uh, but but it's always interesting to hear whenever he uses music in different settings to see, you know, what does it sound like there, and why did he choose to rework it in a different way, um, and. I guess the more information that you have as a musician, the, the better, the more interesting choices you can make. Um, uh, actually, right at the moment, I'm getting ready to perform tomorrow and Sunday, I'm playing some really beautiful transcriptions of Bach chorale preludes that were just arranged by Alan Fletcher for Peggy Pearson and myself. and. Um, and, and actually, we've even further rearranged it to include clarinet and violin. So, so I spent a great deal of time um, listening to, to the originals on the organ and then thinking about all of the different choices that were made into creating the arrangement that we're making. Um, and uh, so with Bach, like what I just said, I think it's really incredibly fascinating that he just took out the alto voice altogether for the for the for the concerto and um, it does does make you think about like what are the important things in the music like obviously the harmony and the, the sort of skeleton of it is the most important thing and um, but the choices of, in counterpoint seem to be like really imaginatively different. Um, and, and also like in the other movements, we were talking about the other movements of this E major concerto and how they're, um, you know, they're different. It's not just strings in, in the cantata. They have their winds, then he gets rid of them for the concerto. Um, so yeah, I do, I do generally listen and look at different scores. And how much would you say that the text actually influences decisions you make? Or is, are you just responding to the harmony and the music? Or does that text inform any of your choices in your interpretation? The text does not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not... Yeah, the text is not so interesting to me, also because I don't feel like I can really understand what that text meant to Bach. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a historian, and I'm a Jew from Brooklyn, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and not religious. <laughs> so I, um, it doesn't, I'm, it's going to take a big leap for me to, to understand that. But I feel a very, very deep feeling in the music of, of, of faith. It's the closest I can get to faith, is my feeling about Bach. Um, and uh, so I don't feel like I need the words. But then again, I love listening to Schubert Lieder, and I have absolutely no idea what they're, what they're singing about uh, in, the, in the text. And I just feel, I know it's sacrilegious, but I just feel it's unimportant. You know, I feel like the music is saying what the music, what, what, the, what, what the text is. The music is telling me what the text is saying. And, I feel like it often is telling it in a more poetic way than when I read the actual poetry. Um, but that might just be because I am a music, an instrumentalist, so I prefer um, the language of music. So. As I look at our Bach Institute fellows, we've spent the last two and a half days talking about text constantly. <laughs> um, and the importance of text and how it informs even for the instrumentalist the gesture. And I often say, play the text, because it's in, you're playing gestures that the singers are singing and you have to think of the words. But it's interesting to hear you say that. I've often thought this cantata repertoire is repertoire that um, there's an impediment to access to it. And that impediment is often the religion, the building in which it's performed, and the language. So to hear you talk about a different entry point to this repertoire is very interesting to me when we're, as a conductor who mostly conducts vo vocal music or at Emmanuel, we create programs around vocal programs mostly and where the orchestra is in a, a collaborative role. I wouldn't say accompaniment, but in a collaborative role to hear an instrumentalist talk about the music from a vantage point that's not about the text is <laughs> well, I, it's also interesting that you're talking about this barrier to cantatas because um, Bach cantatas are what I listen to when I need um, some kind of sustenance. I listen to the cantatas. And, um, and again, I have no idea what the words are saying. I listen to them purely for the music. And... Um, and they revive me. I just, I can't imagine people not liking them. <laughs> it's really hard to, to, yeah. But I think that um, his instrumental music is all about gesture. And it's almost all about, about using a kind of musical rhetoric. Um, and um, sometimes, as musicians, I feel like we can get so seduced by, uh, by looking into the counterpoint. The counterpoint is so mind-boggling. And, you know, as a pianist, you know, you, you're playing so many different lines and you, and you, and you really have to know what every, every single line is doing and they're all doing something. They all have a different direction and they might not actually be relating to each other directly. They might be sort of in combat. Um, and... Um, and you can just be amazed by the technique that's used in creating all of this. But that, that can be, um, that, that is actually not what it's about. I mean, the, the, the counterpoint and the technique is all, and the rhetorical devices, which I would say is his counterpoint. Um, are getting at something else. It's always saying something. And I feel that the, that the music has to, as an instrumentalist, you always have to think about what, what is the point of the phrase? Why is this particular gesture happening? You know, why, why did he choose to leap from here to here and he could have just gone right next to it? Or why did he revoice? Um, the similar passage in a completely different way, and what happens if you hear an inner voice that's saying something different there? 
Um, like that's why uh, you have to be so alert to all of the details is because there's never a moment when he's not actually saying something that is beyond um, the technique. I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but um, I think that maybe singers can think about the words. I've noticed with string players, they can get completely bogged down about bowing. Like they just think that, and everything is about bowing. Bowing is phrasing. But it's not just about ease of playing. Sometimes it's not an easy thing. Sometimes the bowing is awkward because the music is awkward, you know, and, um, and it's saying something that is awkward. And uh, so I guess we all have every, you know, every instrumentalist or singer has their own sort of block that can get between them and expressing what the music is saying. And I think text, maybe text sometimes um, maybe Bach is sometimes using the text. The text is the result of the music. Maybe mm -hmm. he sometimes thinks of the music and then finds the text, you know, like who knows what, how that process went. I, I recently was collaborating with a really amazing choreographer um, Pam Tanowitz, and we did a, we worked together to create a piece to the Goldberg Variations. Mm -hmm. And um, she would come up with these amazing um, phrases of movement. And sometimes she would come up with it, and it was separate from the music. And then I would look at it and I would say, wow, that, 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 that phrase would be absolutely perfect with this particular part of this variation. And then when you see us perform the whole thing, you would never think that the choreography was separated from the music. They, they seem completely melded. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe that was sometimes the process with yeah. Bach. When we spoke earlier, you talked about um, some of the point of the music always having a purpose, whether it's through language or through musical meaning, and that you felt as though it, it's the idea of in the 18th century that music is practical is perhaps a, a simple way to put it, but that here was Bach, um, who was a very had to be practical. He had. I mean, there were the constraints of deadlines, and there were times, like I mentioned in, in my opening, that you know maybe the choir or the orchestra wasn't as great as he wanted them to be, and he had to work around it. Um, and now in the 21st century, we are looking at composers that are sort of, it's like art music, not necessarily music out of function. How much do you feel in your exploration of Bach that that influences what he does and how you approach the music? Um, I think that uh, I guess I think that, that all of his music is infused with spirit. Um, and I have a feeling that that's because he led his whole life as being, um, that I'm, I'm sure that there was no part of his life that wasn't attached to his faith. And so there's all of the music, even the fun music, um, has a feeling of it being a celebration or a search or it's never just shallow. There's nothing shallow ever. Um, and um, with contemporary music, um, 
I think that that's that's rare. That's rarer to find. Mm. Um, I I have been doing um, now. I'm sure there are people here that are going to be outraged by me saying this, but <laughs> I I have been um, playing quite a lot of music by Philip Glass, and um, and I think his music is full of spirit. I feel like everything he does has something to do with his own feeling about the, you know, I, I, I don't even know how to say it, but about life and about um, how people are and how things move in time. And, um, and, and I see certain connections between him and Bach in that he is a working musician. Like he created his life based on performing it based on having an ensemble that played his music, doing operas. He's constantly producing. He's probably the most productive composer that, that there is. I mean, just constantly creating new, new things for new mediums, film, choir, opera, um, you know, what, you name it. Like, if, if Bach was alive today, I'm sure he'd be doing all of those things, you know? Um, and so, um, I guess I'm drawn to music that is, that has this feeling that it's reaching for something that's always bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we wrap up here, the outer movements of the E major concerto that Simone will play. As I mentioned, one is a symphonia that starts Cantata 169, um, which probably many of you would recognize immediately. Um, when Simona plays it with us, she gets the opening lines dum -bee -da -da -ba 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 on the piano. In the version for Cantata 169, it begins with solo violin, and then it's joined by two oboe de mores, English horn, and then about eight measures in, the organ obligato comes in with the melodic material. Um, and I get that too. Yes, <laughs> she gets that too, yes. <laughs> um, the final movement of the Emerger Concerto comes from, as I mentioned, Cantata 49. And it uses the reading of the day as the parable of, from Matthew of the royal wedding feast. And I was saying to Simona, I of course knew the cantata before I knew the, the keyboard concerto. And knowing that the cantata was based on this parable of the wedding feast, and there was this celebratory music that in parts of it was wrought with some tension, some strife, some dissonance, I thought, wow, this is people getting ready for a wedding. <laughs> it's celebratory and there's tension. And there's excitement and there's some arguments going on. <laughs> um, so I wanted to play an excerpt of that, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you be? Would you want to play just a little bit of that opening? Uh, I'd rather not today. Rather not today. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things I'll say is that in the opening of the keyboard concerto, it starts with these triplets in the right hand that sound like this sort of flourish that greets everyone. That doesn't exist in the. Um, in the opening of Cantata 49. But I will play just a little bit of, you, of it for you all, and then you'll have to come back on June 4th to hear Simona play the um, actual one. One moment here. And then after we hear a little bit of this, um, I'd love to open it up to everyone for any questions you may have for Simona. Oh. Etc. and you get the feel of it. 
Anything you hear in that that makes you, that influences the way you play it? Uh, well, I think the concerto is much better. <laughs> <laughs> it has much more bubble in it, and it's, it has, um, I mean, he's using the, the, the abilities of the harpsichord to be much more florid, and, and it ha there's a lot more embellishment, and um, so it just adds, a, it adds more lift to the whole thing. Um, there's something a bit stolid about um, the organ, I think, that you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he also, I mean, with, without the woodwinds, yes. it lightens the texture. He also um, gets rid of all the, the doublings. Yes. So we don't have strings and oboes doubling the, the keyboard instrument a lot of the time, too. So the texture, I think, is more transparent, which gives it that more bubbly... Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I do wish that the keyboard, the Bach keyboard concertos had winds in it. Um, and I, I have wanted to try adding them, um, just because I think, maybe just because I love woodwinds. But um, I just think that it's nice to have that, that texture, that textural difference. Um, hmm. I'm look our orchestral personal, personnel manager is back. They're looking at me. Maybe we'll add them. Oh, that, that there were woodwinds, because all, no, of, all of the keyboard concertos are for strings. Okay. And I think it would be interesting to have some woodwinds in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I might try adding them in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah. Victoria, you, you started us off. Are there other questions? <laughs> yeah? Chloe, will, will you be performing on piano or harpsichord? Oh, piano. I, I, I don't like the harpsichord. <laughs> That's a terrible thing. I mean, I've, I've heard I've heard amazing harpsichord recitals, but in general, I just love the sound of the piano so much. I feel convinced that if Bach heard the modern piano, he would love it. So, what's not to love about it? <laughs> yeah, Caroline. I, I thought about that, um, and I guess I, I'm thinking about right now about the F minor keyboard concerto, which started off as an oboe concerto. So oboe is very similar to a singer, and the slow movement is exactly the same. It's still the oboe line. So it's a very sustained sound, which is maybe, you could argue, less especially on a harpsichord, it doesn't, it doesn't sustain at all, right? Um, I, I think that I, I think that it'd be possible to play the alto line and for it to work on a keyboard instrument. I just think that he, you know, possibly he felt that it was more, I, I don't know, I mean, it, it, is, it, does, it does lend itself to the keyboard in a beautiful way, playing the, the organ part. Um, but I don't think that he did it because it wouldn't work with the alto line. I feel like there's another reason why he didn't use mm. that. Yeah. Other questions? Joy. What is it about the cantatas that, um, that draws you to them for respite? I can't remember if that was the word you used. Yeah, I don't know if I use respite, but, but it's, yeah. I'm going to just repeat the question. So yeah. She asked, um, what is it about the cantatas that draws you to them for respite? Or I think you used the word sustenance, perhaps? Yeah, maybe sus or so solace. Solace? Or, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the joyful cantatas 
can lift you out of anything that you're feeling. And the incredibly sorrowful cantatas are, you know, it's just so expressive. And I, I, I mean, it's, I love the solo cantatas. I love the ones that have full choir. I just feel like there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of exuberance and um, like, there's a kind of electricity in the cantatas that, is, that are, they, they're just full of energy. They have some kind of real energy to them, which is different than even listening to like the Brandenburg concertos, which I love listening to as well, but they're just something about the cantatas that feels like a real celebration or, um, or um, like, the right word. Um, I'm not. It's not prayer, but like it's it's some kind of. I don't know. There's so, there's an uplifting quality to them. Even the very the very sad ones. They're they're reaching for something, and the music is always reaching for something. Mm. And, and I I just love that. Yeah, yeah. I think that particular union of tragedy and sorrow. Grandeur and glory is not. Grandeur and what? Glory. Yes. His meditation to the cross is exactly that. This anti rational, but yet exceedingly cinematic notion of suffering and pain, which is redemption and grand, which I should be very sorry, sorry, why sins put them up there? Rejoicing, I'm free to go to help me cross it. This dichotomy, implicit the theology of the cross, which underlies most of our St. It put me a bit in charge. Here you say, well, I don't care about the word so much, the music just says it. I find this as Pam's and other stuff. But then, let us practically take into account that I can understand. I mean, God doesn't believe it, doesn't study his body. Mm -hmm. But this accounts for that balance, and that's how I left it. Mm -hmm. yeah, more exciting. Yeah, it's probably very close. I'm curious if you on that. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think that you're completely right about where it's coming from and, and um, the motivation of the music. For sure, uh, and I don't think that I need to have the same motivation to enjoy it and to and for it to mean something to me. Um, so, I definitely appreciate all of the kind of the the fact that there's so much sort of theological practice that went into creating Bach. You know, what, what the world that he was in and why he wrote the way he did was a response to his own, um, the way he was taught and the world that he lived in. Um, it's, it, it's really interesting how it's transcended all of that, all of that very particular experience and that, and that particular kind of um, sensibility. It's place. Yeah, yeah yes. to being relevant to people from all different backgrounds, faiths, right. whatever. Um, so, I think that the, 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 what you're talking about, this sort of um, connection between pain and glory, between a feeling of love and hopelessness, which is, which is in the music and in his writing, is maybe something that is just kind of universally human and that we relate to when we listen to the music. Yes, I agree. Yeah. But that's where it comes from. Yes, but yes, many things but come from many see. different places. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Kind of says that. yeah. I mean, you're, there's so much you could say, like I, I, 
it's a very different thing. But I was, I was watching um, a video of my very favorite conductor, who's Furt Fengler. Uh, Furt Fengler. I was watching a video of him conducting Wagner in a, I think it was a munitions factory during World War II. And it was this kind of propaganda film with, you know, with the big Nazi flags and all of the different um, officials. And they showed the workers in the factory and there were soldiers and all these different people listening to him absolutely transfixed by the music, which is ravishingly beautiful. I mean, it's incredibly emotional. Wagner, Furt Wengler, the Berlin Philharmonic, and I'm watching it, and I'm completely moved by this music and by his conducting. And the context of it and what's inspiring it is something that I couldn't relate to less. But the feeling of the music is something that I completely relate to. So I don't feel that I, I don't feel I need to stop listening to Furt Wengler conducting Wagner because of I don't relate to what he, what he was maybe thinking about when he was doing it. It still speaks to me in the end. So I don't think that I need to share or even study what Bach was thinking about in order to feel what I feel. Yeah. Hmm. Bold? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Simona? Peter. Well, I, I've, I've puzzled over the parody cantatas for a long time about why would he do that other than <laughs> the kind of, if you were saying, well, what if he had indigestion and he in, insomnia and he was disappointed with his musicians and he, he needs a cantata? He says, well, I got this thing I did for the inauguration of the mayor, and if I just change mayor to Jesus, I can put so many instrumentals. I'm done, you know, I, I, I'm done with this. And um, maybe that's a little cynical on my part, but I think what he did, well, he did. And but I think what Simone says about the spirit in all of his music sort of sanctifies it. It doesn't matter that it was originally for the opening of the first house because he had this he sense of it. <laughs> you missed that cantata, oh, yeah. Really <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I think I finally came around to thinking, yes, there is in pretty much all of Bach this kind of deepness, this sanctity that means he can um, more easily repurpose music and it almost doesn't matter that he wrote it for something secular then and then he was able to, to re you do it, not recycle, but we create it you know, for, for a different purpose. And it still has the depth of meaning that um, it might not have if it were a lesser composer who was doing all of that stuff because he had to, he had to write for the city council and the church and all that. So that's how I finally came around to thinking, okay, I think I kind of get it. But also, why, why is it a bad thing to reuse? I, I don't, I'm not sure I think it is. It, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, but I think even if um, uh, I, I think it's really imaginative and creative to take things you've done before and to think about them in different ways and to to think about the the difference in tone and texture if you if you change it slightly or you change the instrumentation or you you make it something fun that was something you know uh, maybe more serious in another context um, and uh, I think now of course now we have um, in popular music covers right so you have like the original song and then you have many people reimagining the song in different ways and it's kind of what Bach was doing himself but now it's being done by multiple people and they've done it to his music too um, and I think that's fun I love hearing covers of songs and and hearing how people change them and what they bring to them and you know even hearing the same singer 
you know, when they released the White Album with all of the extra tracks, with all of their outtakes and the first versions of all of the songs that, they, that the Beatles put on the White Album, it was fascinating to hear all the different iterations of the songs, you know. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know you've, you've talked previously about you think you can mention your father as an artist looking at uh, religious paintings uh, relating to maybe the, the particular Sunday that the father was mm. the subject matter in the Bible and then looking at different um, paintings depicting of that scene. It sounds like you've done something similar. Um, whether that gives you uh, an angle or an end to the way you took to look at it. Um, and then separate, the separate separate question is um, would do you think that understanding German uh, has a bearing on understanding what? German? German. Oh. Uh, has a bearing on uh interpreting body. Well the second question I can answer question right is? oh. I think the question was um, how works of art or a way into the music, or a like like visual art, visual about art having to do with religion. Yes, and the second part of it was what was it? <clears throat> whether this, German understanding German also can play a role, yeah, right? Whether understanding German plays a role. I I will just say I've struggled with learning German for a long time, and so I hope it doesn't play a role because <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak it or read it. <laughs> Um, and um, in terms of visual art, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about visual art. I don't know how much Bach thought about visual art. Um, and to be honest, whenever I've gone to Leipzig, I've never been particularly struck by the Baroque art. It's that, that I've not really seen art there. It's actually the contemporary art that I find more interesting in Leipzig. Um, mm -hmm. But... Um, Personally, I find that having spent a lot of time seeing um, like Netherlandish and uh, Northern Renaissance art, I feel like there's a, to me, there's a connection between the kind of emotion in those paintings and in Bach, in that there's a kind of almost, the, the people's faces tend to have a sort of impassive look to them but are also kind of ecstatic at the same time. And um, as opposed to the Italian Renaissance art, which tends to be much more like expressive in a, in a, in a more uh, uh, personal way. Um, and I, I somehow relate the Northern art to, to Bach, but that's just my own aesthetic, uh, you know, connections that I'm drawing, which might not be based on anything but my taste. So. Caroline. Well, I don't go to the piano when I need to clear my head. <laughs> um, but I do think that the two-part inventions are just, and the sinfonias, the three-part inventions, are like some of my favorite pieces. I feel like they're just, they're completely like, they're everything that he does in the most concentrated way and um, every kind of expression that he has in all of his music comes out in them. I think they're just like masterpieces. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Simona. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
so the Remain uh, Next Bach Institute event uh, tomorrow morning. There'll be an open rehearsal with John Harbison conducting Cantata 95. Our fellows will be involved as well as the Chorus and Orchestra of Manual Music. And I hope you'll all come on Saturday, June 4th to hear Simona with the Orchestra of Emanuel Music. Thank you all so much. Thanks.